Hello folks, J. Scott Phillips here and welcome to my channel. Today we are bound for the far future uh, with uh, Mel Hunter's series of book cover art that he entitled The Last Man. And this is also the final week of New World's November, which is a booktube event that was started last year by the bookish Bryants and is co-hosted by quite a few co-hosts. I'm not one of them, but uh, they've invited anyone who's interested in science fiction and has something to contribute to the event to join in, so that's what I'm doing. But like I say, there are a number of co-hosts, and uh, I will leave links to their channels down below in the description. So if you're a science fiction fan or just enjoy reading in general, you might want to check them out because there's a lot of great content and... Uh, they're all this week talking about robots or artificial intelligence, but uh, their stories are going to be covering a, quite a broad spectrum. Now, this week I've been looking forward to doing because it's a little different than what I'm used to putting up here. Usually I'll discuss a story and then uh, also reflect on uh, some of the background of the uh, writers uh, or the background of how the story got published, maybe. And then, uh, since I am an art director in advertising and marketing, I've always enjoyed talking about the artwork that uh, these stories and artists have inspired. And this week is different because the story and the art are one and the same. It's a series of covers that were commissioned to uh, Mel Hunter by the magazine of fantasy and science fiction over the course of decades, really. And uh, they, they focus on a, The Last Man, which is a robot, actually. And it's far enough in the future that civilization on Earth has long since passed. And we'll look at some of the illustrations here and we'll kind of piece together the backstory to this. But even though the main character, and indeed the only character, is a robot, and even so, it's still a pretty human story. So let's, uh, let's take a look at some of these covers, but first uh, let's take a look at the background of Mel Hunter, the artist himself. Mel Hunter was born in 1927 in Oak Park, Illinois, which was just outside of Chicago. And as a kid, he was fascinated by airplanes, and so he loved to draw airplanes and to build wooden models of them. And uh, that led him after college to move to California, where he got a job as a draftsman at Northrop Aircraft. This was in 1950, and his passion for aircraft and astronautics in general were, was growing so much that he wanted to be able to step beyond the drafting table. And so he started to teach himself illustration. Uh, on weekends and in the evenings, he would sit at his kitchen table and practice with gouache on illustration board and learned how to paint pretty well the streamlined fuselages and wings and, and uh, the motion of aircraft and got to be good enough that he was able to actually move beyond the drafting table and became an illustrator of aircraft. And here are just a couple of examples of uh, some of his work. And you can see in one that he had a nice graphic eye for arranging elements on a page. Can't go too far wrong with some of those sleek uh, airplanes uh, back in the day there. Uh, and then uh, also he was able to work from resource material and create his own scenes in this one case the the collision between two aircraft where actually was i believe this was run in life magazine after a, a mid-air collision uh, was in the news and uh, because he was so adept at that and had all the reference material he was able to crank that out pretty quickly in order to uh, get it on the newsstands uh, uh, fairly soon he would continue to be an aircraft illustrator for many years to come but he was even after a couple of years of having taught himself how to paint these types of forms, he wanted to broaden his horizons even further, and he came on the idea of to submit his artwork to some of the science fiction digests. And uh, he sold his first cover in late 1952 to Galaxy Magazine. And let's just take a look at some of his cover art here in the early years of his science fiction exploits. And we see on the left here that first Galaxy science fiction cover that he did. And you can already see that he's 
putting into practice a lot of the things that he learned that he taught himself on how to render the surface of aircraft, or in, in, in these cases, I guess, spacecraft, uh, the metallic sheen of the reflective surfaces, and in a lot of cases here, the motion of aircraft as they're uh, jetting into space or into the sky. And uh, he was really a master at those kinds of things. Plus, he's now having to illustrate a scene or to uh, exemplify a, a, a story that has been written rather than just depicting what uh, used to be the types of things that he w was uh, doing uh, draftsman work for. Now he's telling stories. And I think you can look at these and, and see that his most successful work is when he's depicting a spaceship in flight or in some kind of a situation that doesn't involve uh, the human form. And I think that's because uh, he was, n he never took any actual art classes. He was self-taught and he s specifically was trying to learn how to, how to paint and illustrate aircraft, just the sleek mechanical engineering of those kinds of things and not really anything that was uh, organic. So he probably never took any life drawing classes or anything like that. So when you see some of his human characters, they look a little cartoony and kind of breaks that that uh, spell of realism. But that's where the fun started to come in because he started to merge that streamlined mechanical style that he was so good at with the human form that he maybe wasn't so good at. And uh, cartoony was okay in this case because he was developing this character of... Uh, of a whimsical robot. And he also now had some uh, experience with uh, telling stories in a picture for all these uh, uh, science fiction magazines. So he was putting all that together. And in the October 1955 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, he came out with this cover. One of the fun things about this cover is that it's a story in itself. It does not illustrate any of the stories inside the magazine. So that gives you a chance to kind of explore the scene and come up with your own story, what's really going on in here. The only thing that we know for sure is that it's called The Last Man. So even though The Last Man is a robot, that kind of tells us that the robot is the last sentient survivor of Earth. Uh, and then the, that name, The Last Man, is only mentioned once in any of the copy inside the magazine talking about the cover art. And so that's largely been forgotten, and he's kind of since come to be known as the Lonely Robot, which really tells you enough. But uh, here we see that he's at least an optimistic fellow. He's uh, He's finding something productive to do. He's got a little moment of hope here. And as you can see, he's watering a single rose that's trying to uh, sprout through this deserty wasteland of, of the future Earth. Uh, one of the things that we can assume maybe is the what happened to Earth is some kind of a nuclear holocaust because the city in the background is in ruins and looks like it's glowing with radioactivity. This kind of reminds me of a scene in the Pixar movie Wally, -E, where early in the movie we see Wally -E trying to water a little plant that's also trying to grow up through a similar wasteland. But uh, I think the main difference between Wally -E and particularly the first act of that movie is that Wally -E had a reason to get up out of bed in the morning. He had a job. And the lonely robot, I don't think you're going to see in any of the upcoming covers that he has anything to do but just fight boredom and trying to find little moments of of hope or positivity and how he deals with that. And he always seems to manage a, a way of, of having a, a humorous outcome to it. But the, the whole series is at the same time as they're funny and humorous, they're also really sad. And that's great storytelling to me. It's like, I remember Ray Bradbury once saying that uh, his stories were 50% exhilaration and 50% terror. And that's kind of what these covers are like. It tells such a full, rich story in such simple terms. And uh, that's why I think this series was so popular.
They were fun and also gave you something profound to think about. Then almost a couple of years go by before we get to see the Lonely Robot again, but now at least he's been busy for a little while. With the July 1957 cover, we see that he's been digging a hole, excavating some things, and he's come across an old box of uh, catalogs and phone books and things, and now he's taking a break, curling up with the uh, yellow pages. And uh, talk about some dry reading. Uh, there's, there's no phone number that he's going to be able to call, no one on the other end of the line, no business that he needs to go and deal with, but uh, at least he has something now to read and ponder. And uh, kind of a, again, a funny cover, but kind of sad. If you contemplate his fate, this is all he's got to do. Is he just going to keep digging and looking for other things? This one reminds me of... Uh, the Twilight Zone with Burgess Meredith on the steps of the of the public library there when he breaks his glasses. But at least here, the, the lonely robot doesn't have to worry about losing his glasses. He just doesn't really have anything very interesting to read. Two more years go by before we get to see the lonely robot again. And this time there could be a significant event. In the December 1959 issue, we get a cover that is titled The New Eve. So this one is really interesting because we see that the lonely robot here, the last man, has been surprised by something coming up out of the sand, and it's not the flower he's been watering before. It's another robotic hand holding onto a piece of cloth that's fluttering in the breeze there. Seems to get his attention. And since it's called the New Eve, we have to assume that that's a female robot that's buried under the sand. And what does that mean? Is is she still operating? Is is she is is her battery life still good? Uh, is he going to dig her up? We know he's got a shovel from the previous issue, but uh, what what's he going to do? Is, is that now going to give him some reason to get up out of bed in the morning or to go to bed at night? Uh, what's going to happen here? Lots of things to kind of contemplate. There's nothing on the horizon there other than that lost little tower out there. So can he go and find his shovel and dig her up and, and hopefully get her running and, and have a little uh, companion there for, for the rest of eternity? And wondering now that re raises a question to me, is she still operating? Is she battery powered or what? What's keeping him running? The lonely robot here, the last man, reminds me of some of the the Clifford D. Simak robots that uh, sometimes tend to inherit the earth and keep going without uh, humankind around. But uh, we don't know what really gets this guy ticking. Hopefully, it's the last Eve. Well, I'll just break it to you now. Uh, unfortunately, we never see the new Eve ever again. And we don't know what happened. We don't know if he was able to dig her up or rescue her out of the sand, if she was still functioning, if they just didn't get along. We don't know. So even that is up for your own interpretation between covers. But we do know that the lonely robot himself keeps on ticking. And in the May 1960 issue, we see that he's found something to do. He's found a stereo, and he's got the speaker set up with a chair in the middle there, as we can see. And then down below on the ground is a turntable playing a single record. I hope he's got more than just the one record to listen to, but uh, the, the cover itself is titled Music to Watch the Moon Rise By. Now, that's a huge moon. So I hope that's just a perspective thing and that the moon isn't getting closer and closer to Earth. Uh, that would be bad. But that one record, uh, Mel Hunter gave us a kind of a period stereo system there. He didn't give us a futuristic music system. So if this May 1960 issue came out in March, usually came out a couple months ahead of its cover date, uh, I looked this up just out of curiosity. And the number one song in the United States when this magazine hit the newsstands was Theme from a Summer Place. So... If you imagine that that's the, the song, the record that he's listening to, how does that color the experience of telling this story here? 
To me, that really works well. It really fits if you can imagine that as you're looking at this photo. Or pick another song that you really like that you think that he might be listening to. How does that change the story or the mood of uh, what's what he's going through here as he watches that giant moon rise? Then a few months later, in the December 1960 issue, uh, the last man has found another box of old artifacts, this time a bunch of wind-up toys. The good news here is that he seems to be winding these toys up under the light of a total eclipse of the sun. So if that's the case, at least we don't have to worry about the moon crashing into the earth at this point. Uh, on the other hand, I guess if it's a black hole, we might have some other issues. But uh, this seems like this could keep him busy for a little while. He's, uh, he's winding these toys up, and when they wind down, he can start winding them back up again. But that raises the question again to me is, what winds him up? And uh, is, is he solar-powered? That would kind of make sense, uh, except then it would be kind of ironic that he's winding these toys up while uh, there's a solar eclipse going on. So he's not getting his solar energy here at the moment. But uh, that's reading way too much into it. But these are the kind of covers that you just like to dig into and find little clues and things and fill in your own story. Another question I have is, what's the antenna for? Does he need that anymore? Is he in communication with anybody or anything left over? Uh, we don't know. A few months later, in the August 1961 issue, the robot has found his way back into the city and is now exploring a museum where terror lurks. I think this is supposed to be an art museum, uh, judging by the sculpture and the paintings in the outer gallery there. But the lonely robot has found his way into a darker room by flashlight and is terrified by something that he sees lurking in the corner there. And if you can't read that plaque on the exhibit in the dark, it says, Gift of Mrs. Eleandra Fool. And the title of the sculpture is just The Robot by Salvatore Bali, who lived from 1921 to 1976. So at least that tells us that the destruction of civilization was sometime after 1976. Don't know how helpful that is, but at least there's a clue there. The January issues of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction were usually Christmas themed since they actually came out a month before the cover date. And in 1962, the January 1962 issue had a, a Christmas cover featuring our lonely robot. And there's been a Christmas miracle. Uh, our robot has found a Santa Claus suit that he's trying on for size. And this makes me wonder just how tall is the robot anyway? Is he seven feet tall? The Santa suit looks like it's coming up a bit short on him there, but maybe he's just not filling it out properly. Down on the ground, if you can't read that, it's a, it's a copy of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. So... Uh, he's going to have a nice little Merry Christmas there all on his own. So, uh, uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. We don't get to see the robot again for a couple of years until the March 1964 issue. And uh, he's found a new hobby. I wonder if he got a painting set for Christmas on the last cover. Uh, and he's been practicing. He's actually getting pretty good. We get a nice little insight into the robot's humanity here. He still apparently sees his world as a nice, lush, and thriving place, even though he's painting a blasted-out uh, barren landscape there. But uh, I think we can assume that the end of civilization was brought on by a nuclear holocaust of some kind, because where he's got a city in his painting that seems to be thriving uh, in the distance there of the actual current scene is just an empty crater. So it's kind of hopeful and sad again, all in one painting. Still has a, a humorous and uh, warm-hearted touch to it, even though if you look too deeply, it's, it's just profoundly sad again. That ended the first series of The Last Man covers, uh, covering about an eight and a half year span off and on. But Mel Hunter was winding down his science fiction illustration at that time, and he only did about another six non-robot covers for the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and I think one other uh, science fiction 
cover drawing for a book and uh, nothing at all for any of the other science fiction digests. Uh, uh, he was instead kind of pulling up stakes and moving from New York to Vermont, where he was. He bought a farmhouse and was experimenting with a new type of lithography that used a mylar drawing surface, kind of an experimental thing that he was playing around with. And he became kind of a pioneer of that uh, of that technique. But uh, a, a few years later, in late 1969, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction kind of came calling back and commissioned him to do, they wanted him to do six more robot covers over the period of two more years because they were launching a, a new offer to their readers where you could buy a cover art that was a, like a poster cover art that didn't have all the graphic overlays. It was just the illustration itself. And uh, to launch that, they wanted to announce uh, a new series of, of The Last Man uh, Lonely Robot covers. Those were going to trickle out over two years, and then that would be it. And during that time, uh, Mel Hunter wasn't really doing any other kind of science fiction illustration at all. The The closest he came was doing some illustrations for some children's science books. Other than that, he was really getting into nothing but the uh, uh, fine art uh, side of life. Uh, and uh, But in the January 1972 issue, we got the first of the second series of Mel Hunter Lonely Robot covers. And it looks like after taking a little time off and maybe settling a little more comfortably into this post-apocalyptic world of his, uh, the lonely robot is uh, having more fun. And here we get to see him tooling around in a dune buggy or an old jalopy of some kind and just having a, a good old time. Uh, he probably has a new hobby here. He likes to repair old automobiles and uh, tinker around with those somehow and then go for these little joy rides on the, on the dunes of the future Earth. And... Uh, just a lot of fun here having a good, good time. Uh, I always look a little too far into these things and I start wondering where does he get the gasoline or where does he get the spare parts and all that. But it uh, doesn't matter. He's, he's having a good time again and uh, that's what matters. Now, as I say, the new commissioned artwork was for six more covers. And if you count this next one, uh, it throws the count off to seven. But I think what was going on here is that this was actually commissioned for a book that the magazine of fantasy and science fiction was releasing for their 20th anniversary. And it was just going to be an anthology of stories from the first 20 years. And uh, with that in mind, the cover makes a, a lot of sense. And then it also worked well as a cover for the magazine itself. And it was used for the May 1970 issue. And uh, now the Lonely Robot has found a stack of old fantasy and science fiction magazines that probably go back 20 years. And uh, we don't see that he's uh, dug them up like he did with the Yellow Pages and the old Sears and Roebuck catalogs uh, uh, several years earlier. But he does have them stacked in uh, little TBR stacks, I think. So it's something that uh, all of us who like reading science fiction might be able to relate to. Uh, so he's got uh, he's got something to keep him occupied now for the next several years and uh, having a good time doing it. Unless maybe if you consider what happens to him when uh, he comes across some of the issues that have him on the cover. Then a few months later for the September 1970 issue, we get a cover that kind of uh, raises a few questions. I think our first impression here is that he is supposed to be in for a long wait here because that light is never going to change and he's just following his programming. But I don't think that's the case because we've never seen him following programming before. He has his own mind and can act autonomously. And then also something is powering that that uh, traffic light there, the traffic sign there, uh, both sides of that weight and cross that probably says are lit up. So wouldn't the timer still be working on that? And then that also raises the question, where is it getting its power? <laughs> and so there must still be electricity running somehow. Is he keeping that, all that running? And then thinking back to the one where he was listening to the stereo, something was powering the stereo. I didn't think to mention that before, but... Uh, 
<laughs> so uh, this post-apocalyptic world must still have some power. Maybe it's just running off of uh, static radiation, maybe. But something's keeping a few things running, including the robot himself. Uh, again, I'm looking way too deeply into these things. But uh, that's what these kind of covers let you do, is uh, just let your imagination go with a few little clues here, and you get to build a whole world. A few months later, for the December 1970 issue, we get another kind of a sad cover. The robot doesn't seem to be having any fun in this one here. He's just kind of mired in that rowboat that's half buried in the sand, the ocean or the lake or whatever that boat used to swim around in is just gone. Is there any water left on this planet anywhere? I, I wonder if he used up the last of the water when he was watering that rose early on. But uh, he clearly is not going anywhere in that rowboat. Maybe he's just pretending, kind of reminiscing, maybe. But uh, uh, he's just got nowhere to go in this cover. And it, it's uh, To me, it's, it's one of the sadder ones. Then by the March 1971 cover, uh, we're getting a little concern for our lonely robot getting even lonelier. Because at first look, it uh, appears that he's found a little vanity mirror and is starting to put on some makeup and, and putting on a nice bright face for some reason. But uh, on closer look, we realize that, no, he's turned this little vanity station here into a bit of a repair kit. He's actually touching up what looks like scorch marks or some kind of scarring on his uh, metal faceplate there. And then if you look down on the table in front of the mirror, there's an oil can and some other kind of little uh, applicator tube. So this has become a little repair station for him so that he can uh, uh, fix himself up and, and keep ticking, apparently. When the October 1971 issue came out, that was back in the days when the World Series was still played in October. So we got a baseball-themed cover here this time, and it looks as though our lonely robot may have found a friend. Uh, although I don't think that's the case. I think that's probably just a pitching machine. And even though it has eyes there glowing in the, in the distance, I don't think it's a robot. I think it's just a machine, an automatic machine. Maybe it needs uh, some eyes in this future world here in order to, to uh, kind of by scanning can, can uh, gauge its pitches or something. But otherwise, uh, we don't have a lonely robot and we don't have a last man. So I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that uh, that's not a robot out there pitching to him. That's just a pitching machine. As I say, I'm probably looking too deeply into some of these, but that's that's the fun of the covers. But uh, as far as looking too deeply, I, I wonder if Mel Hunter is having a little nod at his uh, Chicago upbringing here because the cap that uh, the Lonely Robot is wearing looks like it might be an old White Sox cap, perhaps. Uh, nondescript, but the colors just... I don't know what other cap that might be if, if not an old White Sox cap. So uh, <laughs> how's that for reading too much into a cover? Then we come to the December 1971 issue, which was the last of the second series of uh, Lonely Robot covers by Mel Hunter. And it looks like the Lonely Robot is still trying to have some fun here. He's kind of stuck. He's trying to untangle a bunch of strings from a, a an old uh, Punch and Judy puppet show. Uh, but uh, he'll get there. He's got plenty of time to do that. And it's a, a fitting end, I think, to the Lonely Robot series in that the show must go on. And that's what he's going to try to do, I think. Now, a lot like the Lonely Robot series itself, this whole story ends with kind of a sad but yet inspirational tone to it. And that is that uh, by 2003, 32 years after his last robot cover, Mel Hunter was suffering from Parkinson's disease and bone cancer. But uh, at about that time, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction reached out to him one more time and invited him to do a Lonely Robot cover. Uh, one more. And uh, it was a good one. This was for the May 2003 issue. And I don't know how advanced the Parkinson's was at this point, because looking at the illustration, it looks just as strong and under control as anything we've seen Hunter do before. Uh, so uh, that's a good sign at this point, I think. Plus, it's a fun illustration. We get to see the lonely robot 
still manning his post of, of some kind here. In this case, he's sitting atop a lifeguard tower. There's an old sign there hanging loose from the front of it that says lifeguard on duty. And uh, he, he appears to be hailing somebody and pointing at something on the beach in front of him there. But uh, he's probably just pretending. We've never seen any indication of anybody else anywhere in this world. Uh, but it's uh, it's got the same humorous tone with kind of the uh, melancholy mood behind it. And uh, it's a great note to go out on, I think. Mel Hunter died of bone cancer less than a year after that last cover came out. But uh, I feel like it was a great send-off of an illustration for the whole the Last Man series. And uh, uh, speaking of send-offs, uh, Mel Hunter, his last wish was to have his remains launched into space. And it took a while, but uh, finally his ashes were launched on the New Frontier flight of May 2012. And that was, a, I think, a, a fitting tribute to someone with his passion for aircraft and astronautics all through his life. So on that note, let's take one last run through all the covers here and let me know in the comments below if you have a favorite out of all these covers or a couple favorites or any stories that occur to you out of the images that uh, Mel Hunter gave us. Uh, it's a lot of fun to explore these illustrations and uh, uh, share the thoughts. A great cover series and I wish we got more of these kinds of things from time to time. So before wrapping up my contribution to the fourth and final week of New World's November, uh, I'd like to touch on two of the sub-themes that the Bookish Bryants have offered us to, to cover that could overlap into any of the stories that we chat about here through the month. And uh, one of them being The Far Future. can definitely check that one off the list as far as The Lonely Robot goes, as well as Humorous. Uh, there was also some melancholy moments. Uh, we don't have that as a category, but uh, that's fine. It was uh, still a lot of fun. And I'd like to thank the Bookish Bryants for continuing this tradition, and I hope uh, we get to do this again next year, and I'll, I'll uh, try to have some contributions to offer up for whatever the categories are uh, then looking ahead. And uh, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the tour of the future with uh, The Lonely Robot by Mel Hunter. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. And I'll let you get back to reading whatever you're reading now. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks a lot.